Hey to my fans, I want you to know something. I love you. That's basically it. I want to say I love you. You guys are the best. Thanks for making me money. I need money so I can live in a house. But that's neither here nor there. So listen, guys. The two greatest geniuses, Howard Stern and Norm MacDonald, want to be in the trenches right next to them. And that means more than anything else they could achieve in this business. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for saying that. My fans said that, not me. So don't think I'm some cocky bastard. Uh, I think without me, Howard would be living in a slightly smaller mansion than 25,000 square feet. All right, guys? I love you. Be well. Be safe. Take care. Brush your hair. Hello and welcome to another edition of Here's the Pitch. I'm your YouTube friend Brad, and again, this is sponsored by Masses Restaurants in St. Louis, five locations, stlmasses.com is our website. Go there if you're driving through. Today our guest is Anthony Boza, and as you saw in our little tease there, uh, Artie Lang's still hanging out there on Cameo. Uh, Not looking so great, but uh, we'll talk to Anthony about that. He wrote three books with Artie Lang, including Too Fat to Fish and Crash and Burn. So we're going to talk about that experience and get some updates and... uh, just see what that was like. So if you enjoy Artie Lang, I think you'll enjoy today's show. If you like uh, real estate information, financial news, law, check out my other stuff as I'm kind of branching out and adding other channels to my channel here. Um, so we'll be doing some more real estate talk, how to buy a house, how to refinance, all that good stuff. And uh, I'll continue to do some daily updates on the uh, Stern Show. I've been doing the rundown of what I've heard, and um, Stephen A. Smith was on on Wednesday of January 18th. I know these uh, kind of are evergreen, these interviews, So, uh, but the Stephen A. Smith interview is pretty good, especially the stuff talking about Kobe Bryant, but I do a daily rundown as a short, so go ahead and uh, subscribe to this channel. Do super thanks, I have that enacted, and I'm gonna even do memberships. Are people interested in that? Comment and let me know what you wanna do. What do you wanna see on this channel coming forward here in 2023? Uh, hopefully you're enjoying what you're seeing now. And uh, again, the super thanks is enacted, so go do that. If you're a big fan, I appreciate that. Comment, subscribe, get the notification bells ringing because I'm going to be doing more and more content uh, here in this year and beyond. I've uh, enjoyed seeing a lot of the comments, uh, good and bad. You can do whatever you'd like. So with all that said, uh, by the way, I think I've said this, but I'm doing stories every day with a rundown of the show. Uh, one minute long rundowns of what I've heard on the show. So I can do more of those too, and I can make them longer. I can make these actual uh, weekly reviews. Maybe I'll do that. So thanks for uh, uh, indulging me, but now let me bring on my guest, uh, Anthony Boza. Hello, Anthony. There you are. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Brad. How are you? Eight-time New York Times bestselling author, Anthony. This is a first, I have to say. Congratulations on all your success. (laughs) Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You've spent time with Tommy Lee, Mick Fleetwood, Eminem. We're going to talk about all of them. But, of course, a lot of fans of this channel come to talk about Artie Lang and Howard Stern. And you, you wrote three <laughs> books with Artie. How yeah. did you hook up with Artie? Just tell us uh, how that became your guy and uh, how you got in, in, involved with him, fortunately or yeah. unfortunately. Hey, it's a little, well, somebody like that, it's a little bit of both, you know what I mean? For sure. It's like, I wouldn't take it back. Um, there's always things that you wish were different and that you hope would change, but you know, um, Artie's the man. I mean, I hit, we hit number one together. So all those other seven people, whatever. <laughs> and I was, I did, you know, I hit the list myself too, but, um, Artie had a, we had an, an agent basically that was, um, at ICM that I think in the second book we really took the task because he was not, he's not really a good guy. Um, but we basically were at the same agency, you know, he wanted to do a book and, uh, and that was it. We got hooked up together. Um, little funny story. I had been, I went to lunch with Artie and I was, I was in a fender bender in a cab in New York city, like four days before. And I was like on my phone, like, an idiot like everyone else and didn't have a seatbelt on in the back seat, which if you're a native New Yorker, you kind of don't do that. You're not going more than 20 miles an hour. Anyway. So I hit my head and, um, like a couple days later, I started getting like black eyes. Like I wasn't really hurt. I had a little lump. It was no big deal, but yeah, I had like black eyes happening. Like I looked like I was Alice Cooper and it was really bad. So I actually wore sunglasses to the meeting. It was at Del Frisco's after I already like finished a show. And it was um, this agent, the publisher who wanted to buy the book. 
and everybody. And I'm sitting there with sunglasses on. And by the end of it, like, I just had to be like, guys, this is why these are on. And Artie told me afterwards that the whole time he was like, I love this guy. He's definitely on heroin. <laughs> so that's what he, he thought I was like totally a junkie. Yeah, you, got, you guys that. got together. Yeah. You get to, you get to become friendly just through uh, his drug abuse. Of course. Did you, did you realize, yeah, I mean, did, have worked out. no, well, did you know, of, <laughs> were you a stern listener? Did you know of him? Were you a fan? And uh, did you realize he was kind of off? Uh, as, like, was he already? I mean, by the time you know you guys write that first book, he's already had his, uh, you know, sleeping on the air and kind of talked about yeah. his heroin. So, just tell me a little bit about the history of you knowing about him, and then were you understanding this is going to be a strange guy to work with? Yeah, well, I grew up on Long Island, so I mean, I was a stern guy for sure. That was like a huge part of my upbringing, um, and I totally knew about Artie, and I thought he was hilarious. Um, And I really, you know, I always had friends in school that were the ones that got in trouble. And it's kind of the same way with a lot of the more difficult yet super interesting people I've chosen to co-write with. Um, I guess I just, I just, I just like that kind of crap. Um, so, you know, I knew what the, what the issues might be and stuff like that, but. You know, I had like basically lived with Tommy Lee, uh, you know, I'd written with Slash. Um, so I, I kind of knew a bit of that. And I and Artie's just so damn funny. I wanted to do it. So charming. And we had a lot in common, but being like Italian-American and stuff like that. So I wasn't worried about that. And also, you know, we did Too Fat to Fish. This is deep in the period for everyone who's read all the books and knows the Artie lore. This is the period where I, he was most together with the lying <laughs> and the like keeping it together, yet doing shit on the slide. So that was the best period, you know, and, um, there were definitely, you know, moments where I knew what was going on, but Artie wasn't going to admit anything. And I was just there to make the best book possible. So have some fun too, always. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I teased this episode with a little bit of his cameo page. Uh, I don't know if you've talked to him of late, tell me any communications. Uh, do you keep in touch with him? If you do, how is he, the cameo page makes me a little scared. Yeah. I haven't spoken to Artie in a minute. Um, not since the pandemic, I keep tabs on him through people. Um, you know, Artie's tough. Yes. Yeah, like we do, we had like a, a, just a little bit of a falling out over some bullshit. And on the third book that we did, he was, you know, he, he was really not in a good way, but he really screwed the pooch in a lot of ways with the book release and promotion and, and all that stuff, which is, which is frustrating. But part of the territory. I'm not annoyed about that at all. I did all is forgiven. I, I love Artie, but no, I haven't talked to him in, uh, in a minute. Yeah. I, but like I said, I, I know I talk to someone who does keep in touch pretty regularly. So I guess it's time. I'd like to talk to him again. I hope he's doing okay. The stuff I've seen make me sad. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I don't know when you wrote the third book was the nose issue already happening. Can you, did you get to deal with him yeah. at that period of time? Because everyone's curious yeah. about that period of time because we didn't hear him on the show. So all we had to yeah. do was see his Twitter and possibly a podcast. Yeah. I mean, the, the second book, Crash and Burn, dealt with like the two years after Stern and like severe depression and, and getting cleanish. Um, and then he sort of, you know, was set up for this great comeback, essentially, you know, with crashing and all this stuff that shut out the town and everything. Um, the nose thing was, again... I was there for the nose. The, the nose was, was in, ex- the nose, the Dick Tracy nose, I like to call it, was, was definitely in existence during, um, when we did Want to Bet, the last book. So that was an issue, you know, and he just, uh, listen, you can't make someone do something, you know, they're not going to do. As he always said on the show, Artie's going to do what Artie's going to do. <laughs> so yeah, the nose, the nose was happening and, you know, things just got worse. I, I've, the pandemic was really hard on him and, uh, but he, but he is finally sober now, um, from everything I hear and from everything I can kind of see. And, uh, a changed person, I think after all the years of abuse, but I don't know, man, it's, it's a sad situation. What, what was it like to document him, you know, stabbing himself? That was sort of the weirdest moment because I was a huge fan and a listener. And I really thought, man, if Artie leaves, I won't probably listen to this show. I really don't. I mean, I don't find yeah. it as entertaining as it was without with with him. Uh, but I felt just terrible. What was it like to hear that news in your own personal? And then when you recounted with him, what was it like to see him kind of discuss? Because I just went back and I read this this part because it's just so crazy that he does talk about it in great detail. But clearly, just out of it, right? I mean, just stabbing himself. He had no idea what he was doing. 
Uh, he, you know, you hear this a lot from addicts and stuff. You know, he relapsed and had so much shame about it that he just didn't want to be there. So he was like, you know, stick from the drugs and the shame and the whole thing sort of came together. And he was out of it. I mean, he drank bleach. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And he knew that there was an intervention. I think he knew, or his mom was coming over. I don't think he knew that it was going to be a full intervention with everybody. I'm glad it was because walking into that would be really hard on anyone to A, deal with quickly and efficiently and B, the psychological and emotional effects, right? Of his poor mother. Um, You know, the thing about Artie that like was always great is that he let me go really detailed. I like to kind of really make whatever I write, try to come off the page as much as possible for people, even if it's gross. So, you know, for example, like the, the pig and shit chapter, that's the big was on Stern. He gave me an audio of that. That was kind of how I earned his trust actually very early in the too fat to fish process. He gave me the audio of that from on the air and was like, let's see what you can do with this. And I wrote the chapter that I wrote that essentially is the way it is. Just like went as detailed as possible, like every micro detail, And that was kind of it. So he knew that, you know, I, as difficult as it was to actually write, because I have, you know, this guy is my friend, like I care about him. Um, I wanted to do that for that scene as well. And, you know, he gave me the material to do it. He's just, the thing about him is when we would go over the more difficult or just desperate or ridiculous things he had done, he doesn't shy away from the details. So he would be brave about that. And it was like, he was talking about somebody else, which, in some ways it is, you know, <laughs> you're that messed up, but, um, he never, never in any of the books that he have, like, I mean, he does have shame, but he didn't shy away from the reality of the most sort of the lowest points of his life. Yeah. How I don't do know you, if that answers your question, no, but that, no. that's kind of what we went for. I was going to say, how do you construct these with him? You know, especially like I said, crash and burn is, is, um, I mean, they're great. Both of them are great, but obviously this one gives you more detail, kind of the background. Okay. He knew what he was doing. Cause you always wondered like, what, what was it like trying to kind of craft a book with him and how do you sort of sit with him? Is it, do you come up with sort of the chapter ideas? Does he kind of just give me that kind of that semantics of that if with him? Sure. Um, well, Artie, you know, he's a great storyteller as anyone who's listened to the Stern show when he was on it, which by the way, I agree with you. Not the same show without him. Just what, and it hasn't been. And Howard's kind of turned a corner. Still, like one of the greatest interviewers of our lifetime. But anyway, just wanted to agree with you there. <laughs> um, you know, he always had a really good sense of what makes a good story and which elements of his life, you know, he wanted to talk about. Um, so more so than you know, some of the musicians that I'd work with who don't really think in like a linear, necessarily like a linear or a textual sense, already kind of had that from just being on the air and doing stand up. So him telling stories were always great. And there was always um I would kind of go there. I mean this changed for different times, but the general thing is that we'd get together, he would have some ideas, he would like kind of send them to me, um, you know, uh or give me like a notebook with ideas. <laughs> um And we would kind of do sessions where we'd go over certain stories. A lot of times he would just like kind of take the tape recorder and almost like he was doing stand up, like walk around the apartment and shit. And um, I'd be sitting there and asking follow up questions. So I'd get like the loose framework from him. Then I would kind of go in and write it, um, send it to him with questions or with like, you know, jokes, like this is my attempt at a joke. I know you got a better one. And sometimes the, one of the greatest, the, some of the greatest parts is where Artie was like, that joke's awesome. It stays. And I was like, Oh, I'm making him laugh. Yes. <laughs> so um, that's kind of how it worked. It would be like, you know, it started to become at two fat to fish was obviously like his, his just autobiography. Right. And then after that, it became everything that happened next, you know? So the structure more became like, you know, his life just got darker and stranger. So that became the structure. Too Fat to Fish was a collection of stories and I sort of arranged it more like chron- chronologically or asked about different periods of time. Um, but it always kind of fired a wonderful narrative. Like he was just in a better place when he wrote that. So and I think he was, you know, his comedic chops were up. He was on the radio every day, even though he was, he was like falling asleep on the air. He was still killing it. Like anyone who saw him doing stand up during that period, he was amazing. So it was like throwing material at somebody at the top of their game 
Um, it was easier then. The other times were, you know, same process. Um, when Artie would be in a bad place or when we were discussing something that was really hard for him, he started not even wanting to meet. So he would like, he bought a couple of the same recorders that I use for interviews and would do them alone in his house. Um, some of those recordings are he's definitely pretty messed up. Uh, and then send them to me and I would have it like, you know, I transcribe it and then I get in and edit it and do my thing. So that's kind of how it went. Um, he liked the writing process, you know, he, he like wrote a couple things, but mostly it was like, like I said, almost like a stand up routine, oral recorded. And then I would take it from there, build it up, send it back to him. He would make some changes, make it better. And then that's it. I'm not an addict. I don't know if you are. I don't want to get into your background, but I just don't. I I just in my head. I I I think it really hit home. Honestly, just recently when Matthew Perry wrote a book and he did an interview circuit. Now this guy's on Friends and he's coming drunk yeah. and drugged and just the way he described all of it took me back to sort of Artie thinking. Okay, because I in my head I'm like, how is Artie blowing all of these opportunities? Going on Stern and Letterman and Conan, yeah. and he's on the Joe yeah. Buck. Why is he fucking this up all the time? Uh, and then after I watching myself that, <laughs> yeah, and then you find I watched the Matthew Perry thing. I'm like, Matthew Perry had way more to lose. He's on a giant show, and it made me sort of understand the the whole thing. So watching Dark Side of the Comedy uh, on Vice, you were part of that. I thought you were great, along with a lot of people that've been on the show. Do you think Artie would like that show? Do you think he was proud that he was one of the ten selected? And what, thoughts on just what uh, his his mindset would be if he if he saw that show? Man, I don't. You know, I don't know where his head's at. You know, he has been sober, and and um, you know, I'm I'm not, but people very close to me have are addicts, are sober, and uh, can always like point out a lot of the psychology involved and you know, your, your whole brain changes essentially when you're totally off of that, off of everything for a while. So I don't know how he would process that. I mean, you know, when I did that interview, I was very, I got very emotional and um, just like missed him and, you know, wanted it. I hope that he would see it. You always hope that like something you do or say is going to affect the person like that and maybe help them make a change to just stay around that's all you can, you know, that's all you can do. Cause like you can send them a rehab as many times as you want. <laughs> if they don't want to do the work, they're not going to do the work. Um, and obviously substances, you know, the Matthew Perry book is gnarly. And, uh, he, he, he's somebody that seems very angry still, <laughs> but I think he, but I like that he was so real about just, uh, how much it controls you and just how repetitive it gets, you know, <laughs> like, that, you know, that, that is the, the thing that you care about more than anything else. Nothing else matters. Just want to like go get high and get fucked up. And, and he, and he so. even, yeah, he mentions too, and, and that, that the, the getting off of it is the hardest part because you feel so good. And now you've got this base of feeling this way. And when you don't have it, now you're not medicated. And this is a two week thing, a struggle. So of course, why would you want to feel like shit for two weeks? If you're going to feel this way. It's, and it, it did finally, I mean, Maybe you wrote about it. Maybe it's been. T maybe I'm just naive. But it really was. I think it was a Diane Sawyer interview or something. But it was very okay. I understand now. When when you are that famous, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know. No, it doesn't matter at all. If anything, the fame and Artie says this in the books a couple times that he didn't become an opiate addict until he was rich, and he's glad for that. So the fame, if anything gives you more passes like you can get away with more shit you know hollywood loves a comeback but eventually they don't that's and same, you know i think that's what happened to art to be honest but um i think that the fame makes you feel even more invis invincible or you know like you could just go to a fancy rehab again and clean out before you have to do a project i think it gives you more you know, excuses what did you think of how Howard handled that the last three or four years? It just, the, the sleeping on the air became a bit, and he played stupid, as did Robin, as did Fred, as, and I think finally at the end, you know, obviously they fired him before uh, the, the end of 2009, but what, what were your thoughts? It was great radio. It was funny. But at some point you have to really check yourself and go, what are we doing here, right? I mean, what did, what did you think of what, how the way, yeah, Orlando Jones said it was enabling. Give me your thoughts on just what you heard during... Uh, I I agree with Orlando. Um, I totally agree with Orlando. When they were, listen, couldn't be more thankful to have my 
my book <laughs> that I wrote with him, it, like promoted so well for six months straight. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they made it a thing. It was like its own bit. It was like, let's talk about this part of the book and all that stuff. That was fantastic. But a lot of it was painful for me to listen to. I listened to all of it, but knowing what he had been through and knowing that he was teetering a little bit, um, I thought it was too much. Like I agree with Orlando. I don't think it helped. I think it probably made it seem, um, it made it into a bit for him, you know, it made it into the thing that people were, were, that were, it made him, I think these are the things that people like about you. I think it almost like that's probably the message that he was getting, you know, like this is what people want stories about you being fucked up. That's going to make you want to go get fucked up. <laughs> it just is, you know, it's like if you're an al- like an alcoholic shouldn't go, I don't know, wine tasting for two weeks, <laughs> like with people who are wine tasting, you know, something like that. I don't know if I'm making a good enough metaphor, but I think that it, it was hard to listen to, um, they were making light of a situation that is certainly funny because it's arty. He makes waking up in your own, oh, we made make waking up in your own shit funny, but it's really not underneath that. So I, I totally agree that it was a little too celebrated and definitely enabling and in a way making light of it, if that makes sense yeah. too. Well, you know? and he fought everybody so. on the show too. He fought Teddy, he fought Sal, he fought Richard and Gary. And Howard loved yeah. it as a bit, right? And unfortunately, yeah. it was interesting radio. I have to say, I did enjoy I, it myself. <laughs> oh, it was like, it was great radio. It was car crash. Couldn't look away. You know, it was, it was really great radio. But it did take a toll, you know? I didn't, and the last thing from the Dark Side show, the cable over his bed, did that, would that come up in the books? I don't remember seeing or hearing about that, but I think Tim Sabian or somebody wrote about going to his room and there was a cable that his dad, you know, reminding him of his father. And, and I think he, in essence, tries to kind of take all of the things that have happened or people have told him, you know, your father, you know, falling and becoming quadriplegic and you not being there, you usually hold the ladder. A lot of people try to be, some, you know, psychologists. Dr. Drew would come in. Um, right. Was that, right. did you guys get into the, I know there's a ton of father stuff, but I mean, the cable over the thing, do you think he really believes that this is why he's so messed up is because of that moment? I mean, it's an, it's a, something to hang it on. That's for sure. I don't know. We I didn't see the cable in the room. I don't know when that was put up or or whatnot. Um, we didn't talk about that in any of the books. But uh, I don't know. You know, there's no doubt that it probably accelerated it, accelerated his addiction. He was already sort of like using and and you know was working construction and and regularly like drinking and you know doing coke and stuff like that. Um, any kind of tragedy in an addict's life is, is going to accelerate their use for sure. But sometimes I feel that, you know, it, it was something that he always leaned on. Yeah. It, it, it can't just be that one, like all these years later, you know, if you want to like come to peace with it, you got to do some therapy or figure something out. Um, it can't just be that convenient that like, this is the reason why I do all this. It's like 30 years later, man, you know, so, but it's an easy thing to hang it all on that doesn't, doesn't have him involved. Yeah. You know? No, so. I mean, he's an interesting guy. You know, a very, he, you know, I've met him a few times. Nice guy. Probably was messed up when he came through St. Louis. He talks about times when, it, you know, cheeseburgers were thrown at him. I don't think I did that, but, uh, but you've, <laughs> you've spent time with a lot of interesting uh, characters, obviously Tommy Lee, you talked about Slash, Eminem. Um, so, uh, I kind of want to just get some thoughts on some of these folks that you've spent some time with. Uh, Eminem was kind of the guy that kind of broke you. You wrote the first book on Eminem, um, still contact. Cover story too. Yeah. You Rolling yeah, Stone. You wrote it Rolling cover. Stone. Yeah. Tell me about just yeah. the relationship. Uh, you know, I've read, you know, the bio where you heard him and you're like, this is, a, this guy's going to break. And you were totally right. That mm-hmm. has to feel good. I wish I, the one guy I remember saying that about, cause Nelly was from St. Louis. I used to do a public access show. And so the guy before me would edit um, this video, music video show, and his last video all the time was country grammar, and it was before, and it's Nelly in front of St. Louis, and I'm like, that's going to be, that seems like that's going to be pretty big. He's like, oh no, Nelly's going to be big. I'm like, oh, this is good that we know this, and I was right. Tell me what it was like just to sort of see Eminem from the beginning, and then how's your relationship with him? Do you continue to have conversations with him off? You know, every six months, Christmas cards. Tell me just how that kind of started. <laughs> um, Marshall Mathers is really bad. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's, he's, I mean, I've seen him go through his, you know, he's someone who's been sober for 13 or 14 years now. 
Uh, so I've seen like that side of it too. Right. Um, you know, and at the beginning he was, he was like a ton of fun, definitely using it's a party or it's just so talented. Um, and yeah, I'm not really like super friendly like that anymore. He's the kind of person that when he did get sober, you know, which a lot of, which addicts have to do, they have to like really shrink their concentric circles of people. Um, but I did write a second book and, you know, with the cooperation of him and management and all that stuff, I'm still in like the good graces, but, um, you know, I used to like, I used to get prank phone calls from him and stuff like that. <laughs> That's a long time ago, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I don't, you know, I don't really like, I'm not calling him on the weekends and stuff like that, but if I needed a quote or something, I can get it, that kind of thing. So it's professional. Bad, um, bad interviewer question. Really I was going to say, yeah, bad interviewer question. What favorite story, two favorites, like something that really, you know, you think about when you, when you've heard from him or being around him or something like that. Um, I just, you know, we look at him now and, you know, he's become such a pillar of the industry and of you know, hip hop history, essentially. Um, the, everything that I put in my first article in my first book, just this wild ride that I didn't even expect. Like I thought I was going to be, I was, you know, begged my editor to, to let me cover this kid. And he was like, all right, you can do like a little article about the music video for my name is it's all over MTV and this record comes out next month. Who knows what it's going to do? feels like a one note. This guy's not the brightest, but anyway, so um, I thought I was going down to do an article on the video. And then all of a sudden they saw the numbers of what it was doing. And he said, all right, this is your shot. You're going to get to do the cover story. You're going to Detroit and do the whole thing. And I'd never done any of that. Um, and, you know, when I went and spent this one first night with him called never forget it, it was, he had already been signed. Uh, he hadn't gotten any of his money yet. The record hadn't come out. So he was still living in a trailer that when we got to Detroit, had an eviction notice on the door and he left the doors open because they'd been robbed so many times. And, you know, I was in a car with he and Kim and Haley, who's like, you know, she was holding Haley. That stuff I'll never forget. That's like the core of his music and his early music was like right there. And, you know, his manager is still with Paul Rosenberg. They didn't have their act together enough to be like putting this on as some sort of theme. <laughs> There's no way this is, this is how he was living. Um, and when he came to New York, he was doing three little, you know, appearances. One was at a big hip hop night. Um, and one was actually at a 16 year old's birthday. And so I went for that. And the 16 year old was the daughter of some mobbed up Staten Island guy, like really mobbed up. I'm Italian American. I can smell that stuff. So we went there and he had rented out like the movie theater in Staten Island. That was just packed with kids. Like it was the Beatles coming. Um, and that kind of, sh that kind of stuff. I'll just never forget. It was like a hell of a night. It was so insane that all of us in his entourage had to like stay on the stage and the cops took us out the back and into the limo and out. Cause the kids were in the street. They were mobbing hard. Um, and he was just like laughing and rapping and it took like five hits of ecstasy that night. Still rapping, like amazing. His like knees were buckling because he was so high, but it didn't miss a beat. So, I mean, that's, that's, I feel privileged to have been there at that moment. You know, that's like the thing I'll never forget when I see him doing anything essentially. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, to, to do the kind of books that you do and follow the people, they're going to have some skeletons and some real issues, right? I mean, it's impossible. Well, I'll do a yeah. book on Hanson, I guess, but who's going to read it, right? I mean, it, it, how you pick your guys, do you, do you know it going in, all right, this could get up, you know, or is that part of the fun, not the fun, but the interest in the, that th these guys, you know, Tommy Lee obviously had just crazy stories slash we we'll talk about Mick Fleetwood in a second. Who's what seventy? I mean, just tell—is that what kind of brings you to these people to want to write with them? Um, I mean, I have to like the music, you know. So that's that's part of it. Um, it they have to be uh, interesting. When I ask myself, because I do get you know a lot of calls to work with people, um, to my manager and stuff like that. And the, my main question that I always ask is if they hadn't done all this cool stuff would they still be interesting? So, I mean, Tommy Lee is such a character. Like if he was your local cable guy in your town, you would be psyched to go have beers with him on a Friday night. And cause he would probably be the most beloved guy in the bar. Like he's just got the star quality and he's ridiculous and amazing and hilarious. And, uh, so that, you know, that was like a no brainer. Um, you know, Slash 2 is like the epitome of cool. He really is just literally the coolest cat I've ever met. 
<laughs> and the most ridiculous guitar player. So good. So I think that's, that's part of it to me. And, and, you know, all these guys, I don't sit there and go like, you know, let me find the most screwed up person and, and write a book with them. <laughs> but I don't shy away from that kind of stuff. And I think I have an ability to like, you know, when I was a writer, like a senior writer at Rolling Stone, I did go on the road a lot with bands and I'm sort of like comfortable with the lifestyle and everything. So maybe that enables me to kind of hang with them or their trust. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Darkness, everyone's got their dark sides and they do come out and, you know, people that live in that sort of privileged uh, rock and roll strata where you can kind of get your hands on anything and all that kind of stuff. They're going to investigate that at some point, you know, <laughs> so especially guys from like earlier eras, like when things are a little, you know, there weren't and not every person had a camera on them at all times. Yeah, and then so I want to talk about what what you're up to now, but at the same time, when you do a guy like Mick Fleetwood, you catch him probably later in his career, right? Probably in his fifties at that point. So there's so much more material, I would assume, right? I mean, it's harder when you can do Tommy Lee; he's in his late twenties, early thirties, slash probably thirties. But now you got Mick Fleetwood. No, no, they were they were older. I was I Tommy was forty, okay. forty four, and Mick is in his seventies. Um, I was, I, that's kind of what I was getting at. Just like Tommy Lee. Yeah, but yeah. Mick's in his seventies. I guess Tommy. Yeah, Tommy's yeah. an old guy now. I mean, he's a grandpa too, and so is Slash. But but with Mick, it's it's harder. Yeah. Let's talk about the what you're doing with him because we may run out of time here. Hopefully, we don't. But uh, okay. just some of the things that you got going on right now, and then if if we have a little more time, I'll continue asking you, peppering you with more questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, my last book was with uh, I did with Ray Kwan from Wu Tang Clan that came out a year ago in November. Paperback will be coming this year. Um, and then I'm right in the middle of writing a graphic novel with Mick Fleetwood that's coming out on a company called Z2 Comics that put out amazing music-related comics. Check them out if anyone's a big music head. Um, and what they like to do is do a comic about a period of time in an artist's life that's not documented. So it really lets the artists kind of go crazy with it. Um, so we are doing a book called The Adventures of Young Mick Fleetwood. And it's about mixed life before getting into Fleetwood Mac. Um, people might not know there's been three versions of Fleetwood Mac. You know, the third one is the one that everyone knows from America from the seventies with Lindsey Buckingham and Phoenix. But the first one started in like 1967 and Mick dropped out of school when he was 15 in 1965 or four and lived in London with his sister, Sally, who was really involved in the art world. Um, and he had all kinds of crazy adventures playing in blues bands, like cover house bands, all this kind of stuff. He was in a band with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood for like a few months before they went off and, and um, joined Jeff Beck's group. So he's got amazing stuff. His first girlfriend was Patty Boyd, uh, Patty Boyd, who famously married George Harrison and Clapton, you know, that, that one, Layla. Um, Mick dated his, her younger sister and married her. So when he was 16 playing in like a cover band in this, you know, basically this black dance club, he was running around at night with George Harrison, like going to parties with like the Beatles. <laughs> so all this is going to be in the book and it's going to be really cool. Yeah. We've got a great artist named Dave Chisholm doing the art. It's going to be awesome. I'm worried about music, Anthony. I mean, Taylor Hawkins passes, <laughs> uh, Christine McVie, uh, my comedians, Norm MacDonald, Bob Jeff Sag, Beck. Jeff Beck. I mean, I'm really worried because like, I'm getting to that age where I'm sure my dad was at some point going, shit, I have nothing to listen to now. I guess I'll listen to like, Us 3 or Tony, 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 which he did buy records of that stuff. But uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah. you know, it's, it's been sad to see some of these folks die. But uh, I really appreciate your time. Anything else? Did we get everything? I think we're going to possibly run out of time so i don't want to lose you but anything I think we got five minutes but <laughs> um yeah that's cool and yeah that's about all i'm doing doing some work in the documentary world uh doing this documentary um writing and producing this documentary about the cocktail world and this really difficult test that bartenders have to take um or they don't have to take they choose to take but yeah other than that i've got um a book that hasn't been sold yet so i can't jinx it but it involves a late 90s early 2000s of someone who became famous in that era um who's had a very crazy life and has had several near-death experiences i'll leave it at that until i can announce anything but yeah i'm just doing my thing man <laughs> right, we'll keep in touch i want to ask one last question because you are still here yeah. tommy lee evidently so i watched an interview with you actually with artie you lived with him for some days there and then also you wrote the book um, a couple chapters as his member 
Did you see the show on Hulu? Because they did the same thing. They were copying you. I don't know if you saw that. His, his thing was yeah, talking. Yeah. They they plagiarized me and they suck. Um, yeah, those those producers. I I've sort of found out behind the scenes why, but yeah, they completely ripped off the book. Didn't option it. Uh, didn't ask permission. Didn't even get in touch uh, with me. Even though you know I've met uh, Sebastian Stan a couple times. Uh, wonderful dude, and he was like, yeah, I read the book like five times, and you know. Uh, thank you for that. We were told by production that like, no, oh, no one from that side is going to get involved. No one's going to talk. Don't even bother. And I was like, yeah, I want to talk to you. So yeah, that's, that's a case of honestly, um, you know, it's Tommy's copyright on the book. If it was mine, I would have done something about it pretty publicly. Um, and I just don't think he wanted the headache or, you know, it's not like he needs the money. So, um, that's kind of the case of that. But yeah, the, the second episode of that Pam and Tommy situation is pretty much a direct... If you did that in college, you would be called on plagiarism and probably expelled. It's that bad. Because I even wrote that section as a script because uh, Pam was involved in the writing of the book. And I had both of their versions literally as dialogue telling the period of how they met. And it's literally beat for beat if you watch it. It's, it pisses me off because... Um, you know, the guy like D.V. DeVincentis is, is a writer who's adapted books before for Nick Hornby. He should know better. Like, just shame on all of them, frankly. It could have just been like a courtesy call or something like that. But, yeah, they didn't do any of that. Don't watch it then. Yeah. I'm sorry I brought that up. I didn't realize it was a direct no, ripoff. Okay. Uh, but I wanna, when I saw that happen. Yeah, talking, penis was, talking Penis was my idea. I brought it to Tommy and he was like, yeah, dude, fucking yeah. So, and we did it. He talked, the penis talks through the whole book. So he argues about who who's more famous. That, that was the joke that we run through the whole book. So <laughs> No, I don't like people getting their material stolen. I've had that happen to me. It pisses me off, even on a smaller scale, if it's a cardinal feature or something. So I totally understand. Yeah. Um, like I said, if it was my IP, there would be you'd be hearing about it, but it's not my it's not my fight. Well, hopefully we'll catch up again uh, in the future here. Yeah, we'll man. talk we'll talk more about the Tommy Lee stuff. I really appreciate your time today and your Artie uh, stuff, and uh, hopefully he's doing well, right? Let's all wish Artie doing well. <laughs> all right yeah, say a prayer for art that's anthony uh, boza we appreciate uh, your time and i appreciate your time thanks for watching we'll see you next time who's eating me i know you're a huge fan i mean huge literally i heard you love me on the radio i heard five people saw your movie three of them wanted a refund how your movie was free are you still telling your stories <laughs> How do you like your present? Me! <laughs> Me, I'm your present, get it? <laughs>